finally made it to Singapore. It's day three of the Asia trip. The jet lag still got me sort of slowed down a little bit at this time of night. Uh, used to not really be affected by jet lag at all, but now it, now it can really kill me if um, This week, the topic that I really want to talk about, uh, expand upon a little bit, now that it's PhD application season, is perspectives from a new faculty member, myself, and from my conversations with other new faculty members, about what makes for a good PhD application. And I think this is an important perspective to have because while there's a lot of information out there already on how to craft a good PhD application, uh, a lot of that doesn't necessarily cover this new faculty perspective directly. And I think it's an important perspective because new faculty are the ones who sort of invest the most amount of time into looking through PhD applications. Especially in STEM fields and uh, certainly in my field of computer science uh, and HCI specifically. Getting good PhD students is sort of like priority number one. Uh, and you know, new faculty often are not as well known in the field unless you're extremely fortunate to have been a famous graduate student. Uh, which I was not. So we have to, rather than waiting for the students to come to us, we actually have to be a little bit more proactive, look through the student application pool and identify people who might have the skill sets or the fit that we are looking for in the first few students that we work with. All that said, I don't want to cover the same sort of points that other smart people have covered before me. But in this video, I wanted to specifically cover three perspectives or tips or whatever from the new faculty perspective um, on what you can do to improve your chances of getting into a top, uh, at least computer science PhD program. So tip number one or perspective number one or whatever you want to call it is demonstrating excellence in one key area. What I really mean by demonstrating excellence in your application to become a PhD student is showing that you're willing to commit to be excellent at something, right? And so that something could be writing a novel from start to finish. It could be starting a YouTube channel that has amassed a greater following than the paltry following that I already have. Um, it could be, you know, open sourcing a really ambitious programming application that um, is used by other developers in the community or that other developers are contributing towards. It could be being an excellent tennis player or an excellent guitarist or something like that. I want to see that you are the sort of person who can truly commit to a goal, to a passion, to developing a skill, to solving a problem, because that's ultimately what it takes to be a good researcher. You need to be able to commit um, to uh, solving a particular problem and uh, developing whatever skill sets you need to solve that particular problem. So, tip, perspective number two, is have a website or a portfolio. But what a lot of people seem to get wrong with the PhD application process from what I noticed last year, is that they think that the statement of purpose is all we're going to be looking at, along with your GPA and GRE scores, and your letters of recommendation. Your statement of purpose, your letters of recommendation, those are things that pique our interest in your application. But after that, each individual faculty member is going to be looking very deeply into who you are, what you've done. What would be ideal is if, in that application, you could show us a little bit more information about who you are from sort of a more holistic perspective. And a website or a portfolio is a great way to do that. You might think that your sort of work is not really amenable to a portfolio. It seems like you need to have extremely photo heavy or video heavy or media rich sort of work in order to have a website or portfolio that means anything, but that's absolutely not true. In your website or portfolio, you can have anything you want. It doesn't have to be pictures or media. It can be an in-depth exploration of who you are as a person and why you want to do what you want to do. So I strongly recommend having a website or a portfolio as well, so that once we're, once our interest is peaked, we are more likely to learn a little bit more about who you are as a person, get excited about where you are now and what you want to do in the future. So tip perspective number three is to look for non-academic venues in which faculty post their thoughts or sort of the projects that they're excited about working on in the future. You probably received the advice to uh, look over a prospective faculty advisor's papers and mention some of that work um, to display that you are not only sort of interested in their work, but you've actually taken the time, the effort to read their work and actually critically analyze it in some way. Um, that's, that's good advice, of course, but it's not necessarily the only thing that I would recommend. You can think of the publications that currently exist as a distillation of what the faculty were excited about in the past, and that is certainly going to carry on into the future, but something that's already published is probably work that has been done almost a year or two ago. 
So instead of focusing on what they have been thinking about, it'll do you a lot of good if you mention something that they are currently excited about or excited about pursuing in the short-term future. If the faculty advisor you're interested in working with um, is now interested in you know, the intersection of AI and HCI, and that's sort of exactly what you're interested in as well, uh, but that faculty member has not necessarily published an AI and HCI in the past, mentioning something about how you want to work with them specifically on this new idea that they are just starting up can be actually incredibly intriguing to a new faculty member or to an existing faculty member uh, because you know typically they're known for something and if they want to broach into a new area it's much harder to recruit good students for that so if they can see that there's a good student who's willing to work on work on this new thing with them that can be extremely intriguing and extremely exciting and a good way to catch their attention now the important thing is don't be inauthentic about this right make sure that the directions that you're talking about in your statement of purpose are things that you're interested in and knowledgeable about because the worst situation to be in is to you know better up a faculty member into thinking that you might be the perfect fit for this new project that they're thinking about and then they find out that actually you're not interested in that work at all and you were just sort of using it as a way to get into the, into the program and you actually are interested in only the stuff that they had done previously that maybe they don't have funding for or what have you. Right? So look at their you know public social media accounts, look at their uh, blog if they have one. Don't be a weird cyber stalker about it, but oftentimes um, you know uh, academic communication is publicly accessible and publicly available. So yeah, the three tips again were demonstrate excellence in at least one area. Um, tip number two, was have a website or a portfolio so that uh, once you've piqued somebody's interest, they can find more information about you and what you've done and who you are. And then tip number three is look for uh, cues on what a prospective faculty advisor that you're interested in working with might be thinking about in terms of future directions for their research and future directions for their lab and what they want to recruit new PhD students for because publications alone don't necessarily give you the whole story because publications tend to be a distillation of what the faculty member was interested in the past and that might very well be correlated with what they're interested in the future, but it's not necessarily always a one-to-one -one relationship. So, keep those three things in mind in addition to all of the other advice that you might have seen online about how to write a good statement of purpose as well as how to secure good recommendation letters. And you should have a good shot, um, certainly of uh, attracting the attention of new faculty members like me. And so that's it for this vlog, guys. I hope it was helpful. And if you found it helpful, please like, please subscribe, and I will see you next time.